Good morning. Welcome to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. This is my first Grand Rounds back since the New Year, so I haven't seen most of you. Happy New Year. Welcome to 2017. I think I'm a little loud. Let me pull back. On this day, back in 1720, was the death of Giovanni Maria Lancisci. You know that I like all these people from Italy. He was an Italian clinician and anatomist who actually obtained his MD degree in 1672, one month before the age of 18. He became the physician, the personal physician of at least three popes. He examined many causes of sudden death, particularly cardiac death that he published in 1706. Uh, De Mortu Cordis Mortibus, which related to cardiac, cardiac pathology, carried out extensive anatomical epidemiological studies on influenza and malaria, cattle plague. And in 1717, he pushed against the concept of malaria. He, he noticed that the, when the swamps were cleaned up and drained near the city, the incidence of, of the lethal fever, as they called it, would go down. And he speculated that there was something, some injurious substances that came from the swamps that were transferred to people by flies and mosquitoes. This was in early 1700. It took 200 years for Ronald Ross to prove that there was a mosquito transfer of the malaria parasite that caused the disease. On this day was the birth back in 1858 of Daniel Hale Williams. He was an American physician, considered the first black American physician to suture the pericardium. He took a 24-year-old man who was stabbed in the chest, opened him up, and sewed up the pericardium without touching the muscle. That person lived and lived 24 to 20, 30 years later. On this day, back in January 6 of 2017, way back, in January 6 of 2017, while I was in Puerto Rico celebrating for the first time in 30 years, Three Kings Day, was the one millionth viewing of Louisville Lectures. One millionth viewing of Louisville Lectures. And from somewhere in one of 150 countries, because we can't tell exactly which video was viewed, and I was just reminded about this by uh, Dr. Michael Burks, who's sitting somewhere here. Thank you so much, you and the students and the residents who have worked very hard at this, the faculty who have contributed the videos. As uh, Mike put in his letter, it says, there are faculty in this department who have given lectures whose audience could fill an MBA arena. Think about that, okay? So thank you all. Now, today is about obesity. So a couple of things about obesity before I bring Dr. Winters up here. In 1825 was the first U.S. patent for food storage in cans to, I quote, preserve animal substances in tin. It was issued by Ezra Dajet and his nephew Thomas Kensett from New York City. They wanted to can salmon and oysters or whatever. Why is this important? Well, we talked about canned foods all the time, but I've learned recently that there's this thing called bisphenol A, that is used to line these cans, that has been linked somehow, it's a little controversial, to obesity. So we might hear about this today, I don't know. But also it was the day in which the death uh, of, back in 1995, of Adolf Friedrich Johann Butenot. Adolf Friedrich Johann Butenot. And Butenot was a German biochemist who co-winner of the Nobel Prize in 1939 for the isolation of estrogen. And there's a lot of linkages between estrogens and obesity and so forth. It's interesting that the Nazi government made him to refuse the award, but he was then able to accept the honor in 1949. And with that, I leave you Dr. Steve Winters, who's gonna introduce our speaker of the day. Thanks, Jesse. It is true that estrone comes from aromatase, uh, which is found in adipose tissue. But I won't give you any more facts. <laughs> but I will introduce Dr. Villafuerte, who's an associate professor in, in our division, uh, who trained in endocrinology at Emory and um, was on the faculty there, uh, and then came to uh, U of L uh, uh, in 2003. Uh, and uh, Betty is an expert in insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. Uh, she's conducted NIH-sponsored research on how insulin signals to target genes uh, in uh, insulin responsive cells. And uh, Betty is an astute uh, clinician and a true expert uh, in uh, type 2 diabetes. 
She loves to lecture, uh, and uh, today we're going to hear about the connection uh, between diabetes and insulin resistance and diabetes and controversies in the medical management of obesity. Thanks so much. Thank you for coming to this early morning lecture. Hopefully, by the end of this talk, you will learn about complications-based approach to guide treatment and intensity of treatment of obesity, review the guidelines on lifestyle modification and use of pharmacotherapy in managing obesity, and examine the controversial uh, topic on whether we need to eat twice a day, three times a day, or six times a day, and whether we need to eat breakfast all the time, or skip lunch, or um, eat prepackaged food, and what type of behavior do we need to teach our patient and in order to prevent the development of obesity, and what's the relationship between intelligence of a person to, uh, to development of obesity later in life. I am an investigator on the effects of liraglutide on cardiovascular event in type 2 diabetics. So this uh, liraglutide will be mentioned here for the use of uh, treatment for obesity. So I'll start with a case presentation. I have a 52-year-old female who was referred for morbid obesity. She said that she was obese all of her adult life, and she had a Roux-en-Y gastric bypass surgery in 2004. Her pre-surgery weight was 450 pounds, and she lost about 200 pounds a year after surgery. 11 years later, when she came to see me, uh, she weighed 330 pounds, so she has regained about 80 pounds. Her BMI was 56, and I gave her the usual treatment that we were asked, that we were taught to give, which is lifestyle modification including diet therapy. She talked with our dietitian for 30 to 45 minutes. And I did the work up to rule out Cushing's uh, syndrome, uh, hypothyroidism, and polycystic ovary disease, which was all negative. Three months later, with our instruction, she gained 26 pounds, so she was already weighing 356 pounds. So I put her on uh, medical therapy uh, using fentermin at 30 milligram QD. So she lost some weight. And then by next visit, I continue her up to uh, six months of therapy for fentermin. Uh, so she maintained the same weight on, in six month period. Then uh, the latest visit, she was off fentermin for three months. She has regained all her weight and plus more than before therapy. This is actually very typical of obese patients. Uh, the recidivism rate for gaining weight that they have lost is actually very quick. Um, in general, we use body mass index as a measure of obesity. Uh, so this is calculated by measuring weight divided by height in square meter, or we can use their waist circumference more than 40 inches in men and more than 35 inches in women. Obesity is classified into either 
uh, patient is obesity class one when their BMI is above 30, around 30 to 34.9. Class two is 30, uh, BMI of 35 to 39.9. And extreme obesity is BMI of more than 40. There are other ways to measure obesity, including measurement of skin thickness in the subscapular, triceps, biceps, and suprailiac area, or measuring the waist and hip circumference. Normal waist to hip ratio is nine, less than 0.9 for women and less than one for men. In terms of uh, skin thickness, it should be less than four centimeter in males and less than five centimeter in female. Other ways to measure obesity is use of densitometry, which you, we usually do not do, but electric impedance measurement is available in the ACOC clinic on the uh, fifth floor. We also identify obese subjects based on the fat distribution, it, whether their uh, fat accumulation is above or below the waistline. So if their fat accumulation is above the waist, uh, waistline, then they have central obesity or apple-shaped obesity, and if their fat accumulation is below the waistline, they have the pear-shaped obesity. This is more metabolically damaging than this type of obesity. In fact, a lot of people with BMI of 50 or so, if their fat distribution is predominantly gynecoid, they do not develop diabetes. Unfortunately, most of the people that we see in the clinics are morbidly obese, and they have the apple-shaped type of uh, obesity fat distribution. We know that from, from Framingham study, which is all, almost 75 years of tracking the but four generations of people uh, in Framingham, Massachusetts, that obesity is correlated significantly with many chronic diseases, including diabetes. For example, in type 2 diabetes, only 15% of patients have BMI less than 25, 30% uh, have BMI between 25 to 30, and 55% of type 2 diabetics have BMI of over 30. This is also true on the cholesterol level for both males and females, and also on the degree of hypertension for both males and females. There are over 150 uh, complications of the uh, medical complications that has been identified that are associated with obesity some of which include obstructive sleep apnea, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, gallbladder disease, gynecologic abnormality like polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, osteoarthritis, skin problem, venous stasis, um, certain forms of cancer, uh, pancreatitis, the big ones are coronary artery disease, diabetes, dyslipidemia, hypertension, stroke, cataract, and idiopathic intracranial hypertension. The rate of obesity in most of states are between 30 to 34.9%, except for uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and West Virginia, which have a rate of over 35%. One third of the U.S. population is obese, and two thirds are ob 
is overweight or obese. And the cost is very high because 40% of the healthcare expenditure in the United States is related to chronic diseases. And most of the conditions of chronic diseases are associated with obesity. What are the causes of obesity? Some of them are pretty obvious, like lack of energy balance. We eat more than we need to, and we exercise very little. Uh, genes and family history, certain endocrine conditions, drugs like steroids, emotional factors like people with schizophrenia or depression ten tends to get obese, alcoholism, smoking cessation, Pregnancy, if a woman does not lose her pregnant weight, and she will accumulate uh, all the weight that she gained each time she gets pregnant. Lack of sleep, an inactive lifestyle, work schedule, which we all understand, lack of access to healthy food, food advertising now it's no longer on television but mostly through social media in order to reach children lack of neighborhood sidewalks and safe places for recreation so how do we treat obesity different organization medical organization have different recommendation there's a um, the national um, Heart Lung um, Institute has uh, convened a group of people in order to uh, give recommendations on how to deal with this condition. And they try to answer these five questions. I'll give you the specific of their uh, effort after five years of work. The Endocrine Society recommend medication treatment immediately for patients with, uh, who are obese. And the AAC, that's American uh, Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, uh, here is suggesting complication-based evaluation and treatment of obesity, while the British system uh, wants to go straight to bariatric surgery, for which is the most effective treatment. However, um, only 1% of uh, obese subjects undergo bariatric surgery. After five years of, of work, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute recommended a lifestyle treatment for most people with obesity. This includes uh, dietary counseling, increased physical activity, and uh, behavior changes and pharmacotherapy for people with BMI above 30, and surgery for people with BMI above 30, but only laparoscopic gastric banding is recommended. This is what the Medicare will cover. The Canadian system categorize the treatment based on the complications of obesity. So uh, stage one is when they have subclinical risk factors like prediabetes, metabolic syndrome, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and, and so on. Stage two is when they already have the established disease like type two diabetes, hypertension, sleep apnea. Stage three, is when you have already organ damage like myocardial infarction, heart failure, stroke, diabetes, vascular complications. And stage four is if they are disabled already. So there is an increasing uh, degree and intensity of treatment depending on the number of complications that they have. I'm not sure that anybody can see this, but this is the schema suggestion from American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists to intensify the treatment based on the degree of complications. 
for example, on the cardiometabolic end, if the patient has some, um, some of the features of metabolic syndrome, like high waist circumference, high blood pressure, or reduced HDL and high triglycerides, they need to be on lifestyle modification with and without medication. If now they have three of the four risk factors of uh, metabolic syndrome, or including impaired fasting glucose or impaired glucose tolerance, they need to be on intensive lifestyle modification with medication. And if they develop more of the risk factors for diabetes, in addition to medication and intense lifestyle med uh, modification, they need to, surgery has to be considered. And if they develop diabetes and cardiovascular disease, for sure they need surgery. This same recommendation has been given for mechanical uh, dysfunction that occurs with obesity, including the degree of obstructive sleep apnea, uh, reflux, uh, gastroesophageal reflux, osteoarthritis, and immobility. The biggest problem is the economic cost that the society is paying for obesity. 20 years ago, these are the disability rate that occurs with healthy subjects, overweight subjects, and obese subjects. About 10 to 12% of people who are obese are disabled, but that was 20 years ago. The degree of obesity has been increasing by 74% for the past 20 years. So now the statistics has changed significantly. The uh, orange bar are the people who are disabled and obese, and the, um, the working people, uh, the blue bars are the ones who are working and are obese. And you can see in every year between 2009 to 2013, that there's a much higher rate of disabled people who are obese compared to working people who are obese. So increasingly, obesity is being used as a way to get their disability, so the, and non-working people. So the cost to society is very high. What do they mean by lifestyle modification? I tried it on my patient. I recommended diet with dietitian consult, exercise. The patient said she cannot even walk to the mailbox to get her own mail. Uh, behavioral therapy. Um, I gave the usual list of recommendation for behavioral therapy, and it did not work. That's probably true in all of the clinical trials. For example, the diabetes prevention program was started by NIH in which over 3,000 people with prediabetes, meaning they have impaired fasting glucose or impaired glucose tolerance were enrolled in the study. And they were divided into lifestyle modification intense lifestyle modification, then um, the medication, which was, which was metformin. Uh, and it turns out it was the intense lifestyle modification that was the most effective in uh, preventing the development of overt diabetes within three years. Uh, so about 50% of people who underwent intense lifestyle modification uh, did not develop diabetes. There was a 50% rate decrease in development of diabetes over a three-year period. So what do we mean by intense lifestyle modification? Usual diet, exercise, and behavioral therapy. The difference between lifestyle and intense lifestyle modification is there should be a weekly visit 
uh, to a psychologist or a dietitian, on, and they have to participate in individual and group session. They get a behavioral modification curriculum. They get meal replacement, and they get pharmacotherapy. They need to visit the dietitian every week for six months. Then after that, they can do it every two weeks. It is only with somebody overlooking your dietary management and your weight loss effort that it works. So there's an issue of accountability. Somebody has, big brother has to look over you before it will work. Our usual recommendations that we give a list of things that they have to do does not work. Again, uh, this is the DPP program, diabetes program prevention. It says the same thing. Weekly contact is necessary for 20 to 26 weeks. Most studies show that a minimum of 16 contacts is necessary in order to have effective weight loss. Now, in these days, internet or email contact and the use of social media usually is not as effective as direct personal contact, and this includes weekly weighing of the patient. What about behavioral therapy? They need to do their, um, to record their food intake and physical activity by use of paper or electronic diaries. Again, weekly monitoring of weight, and they get structured curriculum of behavior change. There's a lot of psychotherapy involved on what is their weakness, etc. And regular in feedback from an interventionist. So it's a very intense program before you expect any result. What do you mean by exercise? We know that exercise is not required to achieve weight loss. You cannot exercise yourself out of obesity. Only a caloric deficit is needed, but exercise is essential for weight maintenance. For example, the general recommendation is to reduce food intake by 500 kilocalories per day so you can eliminate two of your 20 ounces soda, or alternatively, you can walk about 35 miles a week in order to lose that one pound. Therefore, it is a caloric deficit. It's, it's always diet treatment that will walk, work. So the general recommendation from the Institute of Medicine is to reduce the risk of chronic diseases in adulthood, we should engage in at least 30 minutes of moderate to moderate intensity physical activity above our usual activity at work or home on most of the days of the week to help man manage your weight and prevent gradual unhealthy weight gain that occurs in adulthood, we need to engage in at least 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity activity on most days of the week. And to get actual weight loss when you are already obese, you need to participate in at least 60 to 90 minutes of daily moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity. At the same time, you eat hypocaloric diet. We're a very lazy nation. About only 25% of people actually do the 30 minutes a day uh, walk, uh, moderate physical activity that's needed. And most of them are white people, followed by Asian and Pacific Islander, the non-Hispanic women, meaning most African American, and the Hispanic women are the least uh, active people. And most of the 
activity that is suggested is our aerobic exercise that will involve the large muscle group, meaning the arms and the legs, in a dynamic activity. And this has protective effect on the heart and the lungs. Now, an anaerobic exercise in which you use the energy provided by glycolysis and stored phosphocreatinine is not needed in order to maintain your weight or um, in maintain your heart and lung function. Aerobic activity include brisk walking, dancing, jogging, bicycling, skating, swimming, snow shoveling, lawn mowing, leaf raking, and vacu vacuuming. What is moderate intensity exercise? You need to reach at least three to six metabolic equivalents of physical activity. Three meths would be canoeing or rowing lightly or walking 2.5 miles an hour on a firm surface. surface. Um, four meths would be swimming with moderate efforts. 4.5 meths would be shooting basketball. Uh, five meths would be kayaking, and six meths would be downhill skipping at moderate effort. This is the num uh, moderate exercise that's recommended for us to do every day. In terms of diet therapy, you don't need to do ca complicated calculation. All you need to do is to recommend 1,200 to 1,499 99 kilocalorie per day for women, and 1,500 to 1,800 kilocalorie for men, or uh, 1,200 to 1,500 kilocalorie for people less than 250 pounds, and 1,500 to 1,800 kilocalorie for uh, people over 200 pounds. Uh, all diets will produce weight loss regardless of their macronutrient composition if a consistent caloric deficit is achieved. So it does not matter what type of diet you follow, whether you do the Atkinson Weight Watcher or Ornish diet, low glycemic, high glycemic diet, etc. As long as you eat a hypocaloric diet and you sustain at least 500 um, calorie deficit per day, uh, you will lose weight. What does in, it mean in practical terms? This is a typical meal plan for 1,200 kilocalorie diet. It's actually plentiful of food. For example, you can have cereal, banana, yogurt for breakfast, a baked chicken, vegetable, and brown rice for lunch, and grilled salmon, vegetable, and quinoa for dinner. So that's actually lots of food. What it also means is you cannot have candy bar, which is 200 to 250 calorie. You cannot have pizza because it's mostly 400 to 700 calorie per slice. You cannot have double cheeseburger because it's already 850 calorie or a chocolate shake, which is 740 calorie. Even a hot dog in a bun is almost 500 calories. These are the typical food brought by the pharmaceutical representative to the clinic. And this was uh, actual food that was brought to the clinic. Example, if you eat the fried chicken with macaroni, green beans, uh, bun, and a, a cookie, you'll eat. 1,005 calories for that lunch. On the other hand, if you eliminate the cookie and the macaroni cheese you'll, and put some salad instead, you'll end up with uh, 605 calories. So little things matter. And uh, the same here, if you eat, eat a pulled pork uh, sandwich with potato salad and green beans and a pie, you'll eat 880 calories. Whereas if you remove the least fat part of the bun, remove the potato salad and the dessert, 
you actually cut the um, in your caloric intake to less than 50% of what you would have otherwise eaten. What about medication? In order, uh, medications is directed towards the uh, satiety and hunger center of the brain. And there's afferences signaling from our peripheral tissue that goes to the brain. And these, are, these hormones include leptin and adiponectin from adipose tissue, ghrelin, this is the hunger hormones that come from stomach, peptide YY from ileum colon, and insulin from pancreas. All of these signals go to the brain in the arcuate nucleus of hypothalamus, and it's integrated through two uh, um, set of neurons, including the POMC or pro-opiolo melanocortin or CART, cocaine and amphetamine regulated transcript, and the neuropeptide one and agouti related peptide. And with this signaling, it then goes to our hindbrain, our medulla, carrying the message to our uh, peripheral tissue, back to the peripheral tissue to control our food intake and energy balance. So you have all this peripheral signal going to the brain, and then it, the signal from the hypothalamus go to the medulla uh, in the nucleus tractus solitarius, and you have those vagal uh, signaling that control your feeding, gastric emptying, and metabolism. These are the available medications approved by FDA for treatment of obesity. Benzfentamine, diethylpropion are similar to fentermin. Liraglutide or Saxenta has been approved for uh, the latest, this is the latest medication that's approved for use in treatment of obesity. This is an acylated human GLP-1 receptor agonist which acts mostly on the tractus solitarius of the medulla to control feeding. Lortasterin is a, a serotonin receptor agonist, a serotonin type 2C receptor agonist, which affect the POMC um, activation. Naltrexone bupropion XR is a weak dopamine agonist and a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. Orlistat is a lipase inhibitor, so you do not absorb the fat from your GI system. Uh, Fendimentrasat Tracine are similar to fentermin. Fentermin is probably the medication that I have um, prescribed most. It's a sympathomimetic agent that increases norepinephrine activity in the hypothalamus, and it reduces the appetite and possibly increases energy expenditure. The side effects are dry mouth, constipation, insomnia, headache, tachycardia, and hypertension. And uh, it's contraindicated in people with coronary artery disease, stroke, cardiac arrhythmia, hyperthyroidism, uncontrolled hypertension, and seizure. It is approved by the FDA for short-term use, so it's a three months use only. Again, all of these drugs are targeted towards the anorexigenic pathway and the orexogenic pathway of the brain, which I don't, we don't have time to go through. Um, in terms of effectiveness, fentermin um, combined with uh, topiramate, this combination is called kissimia commercially, is the most effective in uh, making people lose weight, followed by liraglutide, naltrexone, orlist, uh, orlistat, and lorcaserin is the least uh, effective. Uh, the medical, the Medicaid uh, system of California will approve the use of these different uh, medications for people with BMI of 
um, less than 30 if they have comorbid conditions or BMI of more than 30 if, um, and also a different type of bariatric surgery. Uh, this is their assessment on what is effective uh, if they're moderately certain, this uh, gray boxes, if they're moderately certain about the effectiveness of the medication, then they will pay for it. Unfortunately, uh, all of these medications are specifically excluded in Medicare payment. Medicare specify that all this diet pill will not be covered. Fentermin is inexpensive. It costs about $15 to $20 a month, while all of these other uh, recently approved drugs cost about $200 a month. So patient has to be willing to pay for it. Liraglutide costs about $1,000 a month. What we can do, though, in terms of limiting uh, the behavior the treatment is the uh, sugar-sweetened beverages. Uh, sugar-sweetened beverages is a huge contributor to obesity, especially in the minority population. You would be surprised how many of my patients are drinking two liters of Coke a day, you know? In 1965, 2.5% of the total energy um, input comes from sugar-sweetened beverages, but now about 9.1 to 9.5 of the total energy input comes um, from sugar-sweetened beverages. And this starts very early in life. About 22% of toddlers between 21 to 24 months consume at least one sugar-sweetened beverages per day in the form of fruit juice. So the American Heart Association recommend not getting more than 5% of their, your energy intake from sugar-sweetened beverages, and to just drink skim milk, water, or very little, 100% juice. So that's the general recommendation. Small changes do add up. The problem with sugar-sweetened beverages is people do not consider them as food. So ma many people will just consider solid food as real food. And nobody said, I had a meal of Coca-Cola, really. So it, it tends to be neglected in terms of calorie count. So if you drink a diet drink over regular one can of 12 ounces, Coca-Cola, if uh, you'll um, lose actually 15 pounds a year. If you skip the candy bar every day, you'll actually lose 26 pounds a year and so forth. And a lot of my diabetic patients actually eat two scoops of ice cream per, per day and they keep on telling me it's low sugar ice cream and yet they will uh, gain 33 pounds a year. And if you drink two beers a day, you will uh, gain 31 pounds a year. So little changes do matter. So on the controversies of whether we need to eat three meals, six small meals, or uh, we can get away with two meals, there's a lot of study on whether skipping breakfast actually is harmful in terms of making you gain more weight. And the association of breakfast skipping with increased body fatness is consistent across cultures and is well established. This has been shown in the European population, Asian and Pacific region, and in the United States. What has not been considered is most people who skip breakfast do not have enough sleeping time. The reason children do not, uh, uh, do not eat breakfast is because they sleep um, late. Or uh, in the adults, they skip breakfast because they did not have enough sleep. Turns out the sleep path, the duration of sleep, 
has a lot to do with control of your, the hedonistic or the limbic system of the brain. Therefore, uh, it's actually the other factors that really matters in terms of, um, in relation to skipping breakfast. There's a huge experiment going on when the USDA starts supplying food for breakfast in children. This food program started in 1999, uh, and the data between 1999 to 2010 show that uh, people, children who eat breakfast actually has a higher rate of obesity if they, they are below poverty line. And it does not uh, change the amount of food that they will eat for lunch. So large prospective studies also showed eating bre breakfast does not have long, strong association with weight change over time. Actually, breakfast keepers tend to eat less cal calorie if they do not compensate it with other forms of eating, usually snacking. However, it has been shown that skipping breakfast is associated with decrease in spontaneous physical activity and do adversely impact insulin sensitivity. Whether in the long term it will lead, uh, this decreased insulin sensitivity will uh, eventually translate to obesity later on is uncertain. Should we, and there are a lot of data also, uh, trying to examine whether what types of breakfast we need to eat in order to uh, prevent obesity, consuming eggs versus bagels or high fiber food at breakfast uh, will only reduce energy intake at lunch. This has only been shown in overweight and obese subjects and has not been shown in lean subjects. What about the eating pattern? There's a tendency to think that eating six small meals may be more beneficial than eating three regular meals. As it is, uh, somebody is tracking our eating habits. So in men between 1971 to 2010, uh, about 90% of men eat snack once a day. But the three meals a day um, regimen has been decreasing, so uh, skip no meal people has been going down. And the most, more often than not, it's the lunch that most people skip, uh, followed by skipping breakfast. That's the second most meal that is, is skipped. And very few people skip dinner. And it so happened that these same trends occur in women. Again, uh, most people are eating two meals, regular meals, rather than three meals a day. And again, most of the time, they're skipping lunch and followed by skipping breakfast. What happened is uh, enhanced one did track the caloric intake on people who eat snacks all the time. and. These are the, not the data on people who were put on hypocaloric diet. Turns out the more meals you eat, the greater your energy intake will be. So um, for people who are not under hypocaloric diet regimen, uh, eating snacks is actually very harmful. What about Skipping, uh, this is a Japanese study showing that skipping breakfast, uh, this is, is the, their BMI, and these are the odds of developing uh, increasing weight gain. They show that skipping breakfast do contribute to uh, the higher incidence of obesity in Japan, which is BMI of more than 27. And um, B is and um, eating late, this is skipping breakfast, eating late dinner also contribute to increasing weight gain. If you skip breakfast and then eat late dinner, then your possibility of 
uh, gaining weight is much higher. In terms of behavior treatment, we teach our patient to reduce exposure to problem food. For example, if they're addicted to candy bar, they should not buy the candy bar. Avoid uh, fast food restaurants or eat all you can buffet because they really eat all they can. Uh, store foods out of sight so you tend not to remember what to eat unless the food is uh, staring at you. Control portion sizes. Avoid snacking while engaging in other behaviors. It has been shown that most of the snack food are, are uh, caloric dense, uh, people tend to be more conscious of what they eat when it's a uh, regular meal. But what they eat in between the meals, people do not pay enough attention to it. Avoid high risk situation like winter eating and holiday eating. Uh, and know that physical activity can, can be per performed in short bouts, for example, uh, 10 minutes of intensive exercise, uh, moderate intensity exercise times three is as effective as doing the exercise in a 30 minute block. And the ultimate goal is to walk about 10,000 steps daily, the equivalent of four to five miles a day. What about the relationship between intelligence and obesity? Nobody would dare to do this study in the United States, but the data do come from a lot of European countries. This is a UK study showing the IQ test at age seven is highly correlated with the degree of obesity at age 51. So the higher the IQ, the lower the rate of obesity. This has also been shown in Belgium, Swedish study, and many other countries. Therefore, we need to pay a lot of attention to people who are schizophrenic, who are not highly educated because of their mental uh, capacity, and reinforce the treatment early on. So in summary, weight loss of five to 10% is only produced by comprehensive behavioral intervention. This is intense lifestyle modification. It cannot be, be induced by just what I said to the patient, you know, try to walk, you know, here's your 1,200 calorie diet, you know. And it has to be a hypocaloric diet. It's very easy to or, um, eat. Uh, above your required calorie, exercise is needed, and behavior therapy. And diets of varying macronutrient composition are all successful if they induce appropriate energy uh, deficit in, again, 1,200 to 1,500 kilocalories per day, 1,500 to 18 kilocalories per day for men. And physical activity alone is of limited benefit for inducing weight loss, but facilitate long-term, it's necessary to facilitate long-term weight management. And use of pharmacotherapy, meal replacement, intense lifestyle modification, surgery should be considered with increased obesity um, complications. Thank you for your kind attention. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> very helpful, although it came after the holiday eating. Yeah, Eastern probably Eastern. too late. Um, it's interesting to me that obesity, like other chronic illnesses, is easier to prevent than to treat effectively. So why did you pretend to have multiple colors? Mm -hmm. seems to be not the appropriate approach considering that. I would argue that based on what you just said, we should have intensive treatment. Before? Before, like buying a car insurance after car accident. <laughs> no? So here we're treating obesity once it develops. What do you think about that? How intense should the treatment be 
and those for the phone call or have three got refunds or something like that as opposed to waiting until those that BMI keeps on going. Actually, um, that's why there's a lot of um, work by the government in trying to prevent obesity in the children. Most of the, there's a, at least over a billion a year that is being spent to prevent obesity in children. But they're not sure that the direction is correct. For example, thinking that skipping breakfast is harmful, they started the school breakfast program. It turns out not to be really helpful because apparently children think it's free food, so they eat a lot of it, you know. So uh, there is a lot of policy decision that has to be done nationally. Um, New York State tried to prevent obesity by doing the um, sweet, uh, sweetened beverage uh, tax. It was uh, turned down by the Supreme Court of New York State. So there's a lot of government uh, policy that's not working right now. So it's up to the primary care physician to do all this uh, work. It's a lot of work, actually. Yes. Yes, uh, it ac it's actually highly re recommended to be involved in such a program, but it tends to be expensive. Weight Watchers uh, will um, ask you to pay for food. It's about $125 a week that they have to pay for the meal replacement therapy. Most of my patients are in that program. Uh, yeah, uh, there is increasing coverage in the private insurance, uh, but Medicare will, will mostly cover only laparoscopic uh, gastric banding. That's why they convened that um, st five-year study in order to uh, determine what Medicare will pay, but they will not pay for on any of the medications, not at all. You cannot appeal that. Anyway, I think, well, go ahead. Resistance. Yeah, um, there is specific features for some of these drugs. For example, if you have food addiction, it's better for you to take the topiramate, et cetera. But none of these drugs will be prescribed for people with BMI less than 25. Nobody would prescribe it. I will not prescribe it, you know. So, but now the drug development is gearing towards the biologics, you know. There's now in clinical trial a biologic agent like Humira that you have to inject every uh, week. And uh, it's an antibody against one of the uh, methyl malonic acid and it's, it's coming to the market soon, yeah. Uh, 
No, uh, diet soda is good for sugar control if they have to have it. However, uh, there's a lot of evidence showing that drinking diet soda will increase your appetite on the next meal because the center of the, the areas of the brain that require sugar will think they're starving. So there's uh, evidence showing that you'll eat more, actually. I can vouch for that. <laughs> Yeah. And so understanding all the biology behind all this might be pleasant. Thank you and have a good day. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you Thank so much. You.